and welcome to uh, FRS Decision 2016. I'm Zach and I'm here with Melissa. Uh, this is the second uh, part of a series of interviews that we'll be conducting uh, with local leaders to hear what they have to say about the political climate during this critical election season. On election day, we will be holding a three hour live broadcast starting at 5 p.m. to bring you exit poll information conducted by Frontier students at the four voting locations throughout the day. Among our guests on election day, we will have uh, Senate President Stan Rosenberg. And uh, today we welcome Chris Collins. Chris is a uh, political columnist with the Greenfield Recorder. Chris, thank you for joining us. Thanks, good to be here. And uh, diving into the national election, uh, why do you think Donald Trump has been so successful and he's gotten to the place he has I think that the reason why Trump has caught the imagination of the voters, his supporters, is twofold. One, I think there's a lot of frustration out there. There are people that feel as though the President administration has not really done the job they would like them to do. Now, some would argue that that's grounded in racism because we have an African-American president. Some would also argue that it's because the economy was so bad for six years and even though it's turned around recently, I think that there's a feeling that it's turned around not because of Obama's policies, but in spite of them. So you have a lot of frustration in an electorate, and you've got eight years of a Democratic president, and typically at the end of eight years of any party, you have a change election. There's typically the other party that's going to have a lot more support. I think what Donald Trump has done, though, and I think the reason why he has generated a lot of support is he's not your typical politician. But today, politicians are very... Uh, they're very managed. Politicians today are always about triangulation. They're always worried about the next poll. You don't get the sense when you hear a professional politician talk that you're hearing the truth. And there's certainly nothing, you know, everything is scripted. There's nothing off the cuff. Donald Trump, I think, has a certain amount of charisma. And I think that his plain spoken nature was refreshing to people. Although I would submit to you that lately, I don't think it's quite as refreshing as it was in the beginning of the campaign. You mentioned how politicians aren't necessarily trusted. Do you think if Hillary Clinton were to become president, she could ever be trusted after the email scandal? I think one of the problems Hillary Clinton has is that she is unpopular with people who, who feel like she's untrustworthy. I think that you've ne I, I've never seen a politician with such negative numbers in a presidential race this late in terms of her unlikability. But I think if you look at the two candidates and you look at their, their knowledge of the, of the presidency and their ability to do the job, I mean, I go back to that first debate. There's no question that Hillary Clinton, I think, is more qualified to be president than Donald Trump in terms of her knowledge of the office. Where she runs into trouble is she tracks back to this perceived corruption of, first of all, her husband's administration. And also, I think that there's a feeling that she's just not really a very nice person. I think people, when they look at politicians and candidates, they want somebody that they can not just, you know, follow, but they can have a beer with. And I think that there's a, like, a lack of likability about Hillary Clinton that causes her trouble. But I, I think that with what Trump, Donald Trump has done and how he stepped in it recently, uh, I think on election day, she's going to win and probably win pretty big. So people do not like the two major party uh, nominations. Uh, why don't people instead look uh, toward a third party, and why are we so focused on just electing either a Democrat or Republican? Because right now the system is not ready for a third party candidacy. I mean, I think you're, I think you're right. I think if, if there were none of the above option on the ballot, that would win on a landslide this year. But the problem is, especially when it comes to the presidency, that the Democratic and Republican parties have a lock. Um, it's a good question as to why there wouldn't be more support for a third party candidate, especially now with two candidates that are relatively unlikable. Um, but the third party candidate options that are out there, Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, <coughs> I, don't think, I don't think that they appeal to enough of a cross section. I mean, I think if you look at past presidential elections and you look at where the margin of victory was, it's never on the left or the right. We are not, we're not a nation of extremists ideologically. We're a nation of centrists. We're a nation of people that, for the most part, just go to work every day and don't have 
a, a slavish devotion to Democratic or Republican, but yet those two parties have a lock on the system. I've always been a big advocate of not the abolition of the two-party system, but certainly the establishment of a third party that is politically viable. And because I think that's where most, the majority of Americans are. Most people are in the middle, whether they want to admit it or not. They're, we're a nation of centrists, but it hasn't translated into a centrist party that can threaten the two-party system. Considering that neither the Republican nor the Democrat candidates are likable, why should people bother to vote? That's a good question, and that I think is, is the, I think you're going to see a historically low voter turnout, or you're going to see a historically low number of blank ballots, and I think, at least on the presidential race, because people are, are fed up. I mean, I look, I talk politics all the time with people. I have never seen people as sick to death of an election as they are of this one. I mean, people just want it to be over. And maybe it's because presidential elections have gotten longer and longer in the last few years. But I think that there's just so much bickering and so much nonsense. And that's why I think people are, it's, the danger here is that people are going to stay home. And I think if you're a Democrat especially, and you really don't want Donald Trump to win, the, c the concern is that Democrats figure out he's not going to win, they're going to stay home. Um, and. I think people need to vote because I think you have to have, you have to make your voice heard. I think that it's, it's the most important thing we can do in a, in, a, in a free society is exercise the right to vote. There are people all over this world that would give their right arm for the chance to do what we're going to be able to do on November 8th. So I think we have a responsibility to do it. It doesn't mean everybody's going to exercise it. We've seen historically low voter turnouts in local elections in recent years, sometimes including Sunderland, where the, the turnout was less than 5%. That's insane. It means 95% of the people in the town couldn't be bothered. Now, we're going to have bigger turnout because it's a presidential race this year, but I think, comparatively speaking, it'll be a low turnout nationally. All right, so going to the, uh, the uh, state ballot questions, what are your thoughts on uh, the expansion of charter schools? I think that it, for first of all, what's bothering me the most about this campaign is that it's disingenuous. The people who are pushing question two are saying they'll make, you'll create stronger schools. Fundamentally, that's just not true. I mean, when you siphon money out of public schools, traditional public schools, you don't make them stronger, you make them weaker. Because the, the difference between a charter school and a conventional public school is that conventional public schools have to take everybody. Charter schools, whether they say they draw lots, they can pick or choose the students they want. If you can pick and choose what students go through your door, you are, by definition, a private school. So charter schools are publicly funded private schools. And you know, one of the great analogies I heard recently was you com if you compare this to roads, imagine if we decided in Massachusetts, you know, our roads are crumbling and they're you know, underfunded, maintenance is underfunded, so let's create a new series of roads, but there'll be private roads that only certain people can drive on. I mean, that's the same thing as, 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 as raising the cap on charter schools. I understand that it's different out here in rural areas as, as opposed to urban areas, because urban areas have, have schools that, are, you know, systems that are basically war zones. And the parents there want their kids to have alternatives. I get that. But out here, we don't have that problem. All it's going to do is damage places like Frontier because it's going to suck more money out of the system. So no, I'm not a big fan of it. And how do you feel about the possibility of there being casinos out here as well? Well, I've never been a big fan of casinos simply because I've never been a big fan of a state making money off of people's addictions. And if you look at casino gambling, I mean, the people that go into casinos and spend all day there are not often the ones that can afford to. And, and I think we've seen, we've seen examples in this commonwealth where we're not, we have no problem with you know, taking advantage of people if we can make a buck. The state lottery is a perfect example of that. I mean, even though a lot of the money from the state lottery goes back to cities and towns in the form of direct local aid, the reality is that the people that, pay, that play the lottery can't necessarily afford to pay the lottery. Have you ever gone to a, a convenience store and saw, seen people taking, you know, armloads of tickets? Those people don't look like they have a lot of money because a lot of them don't, but they're addicted. They like to play the game. So. I don't think casinos are good public policy. I think it's bad, uh, a bad public policy, and I think it creates more problems than it will ever, ever, will ever solve in terms of 
the money coming in. People always say, well, if you have casinos, it increases economic development. Yeah, but at what cost? Because there's, there's no way you can really estimate the social impact of allowing and expanding casino gambling. So how do you feel about um, the legalization of uh, marijuana for recreational use, and do you think it'll lead to any negative effects throughout our communities? Well, I, I, it's ironic. I just, uh, I just moderated a forum on this, which, by the way, you can see on, on, on FCAT. Um, it's very interesting in, in that we had people on both sides of the issue, and it was very boisterous. You know, a lot of times you think people that smoke marijuana are very mellow, these people were not. Um, but there were a lot of good points that were brought up during that debate. But one of the things that I've paid the most attention to is the reaction of state officials. Because whenever a ballot question passes, you know, the people have their say, but it's up to the state officials to implement it. And when I hear people like Stan Rosenberg, and I talk to him about the ballot question, the first thing he says to me is, it's, it's very problematic the way it's written, because it's, it oversimplifies the issue. And it's not really implementable the way it is. So when I hear things like that, alarm bells go up. Now, the people who are opposed to question four, opposed to its passage, are concerned about the impacts on young people, people like you. And the concern is that even though this deals with people 21 years of age or older being able to consume marijuana recreationally, the concern is that if you make it easier for people, to, for this stuff to be in the public, then it makes it easier for kids to get a hold of it, especially in terms of consumables. There's a lot of edible marijuana, there's candy, that kind of thing. But here's the thing, and this is something that I think people have to recognize. Right now, you can possess up to an ounce of marijuana with, you know, perfectly fine. It, it, it's decriminalized. Now, that's a lot of pot. I mean, an ounce of marijuana is not an insignificant amount of marijuana. So you can possess up to an ounce of it, and if you're caught with it, or caught with over an ounce, it's a $20 fine, or civil fine, which, by the way, a lot of police departments haven't figured out how to collect. So I don't know why we have to go the next step beyond decriminalization, because you can possess a certain, a big amount of it without having to worry about being arrested. So why do we have to go the next step? I understand the argument against prohibition. I understand that, you know, we, we, we you know, we, banned alcohol and we had a problem with prohibition and the black market exploded and they repealed it. But has anybody argue that alcohol is necessarily a good thing? I mean, it, it, how many people have died? How many people have been killed in drunk driving accidents? Plus you have no way to measure, by the way, if someone's on, under the influence of marijuana, there's no way to measure if they're impaired while driving. That's another point that people don't really talk much about. So I. I can't tell you how I'm going to vote on this, but I can tell you that I, there's strong arguments on both sides. And I think it will have an impact socially, especially if more kids can get their hands on it. Do you think it matters where the political candidate, candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, stand on the issue of legalizing marijuana nationally? No, because that's the thing. This is a state issue. Federally, it's still illegal. There are a few states that have legalized it, but federally, it is is considered to be illegal. And that's the other thing that's interesting is, you know, you've got states that are now, despite federal bans on marijuana, despite the fact that it's illegal to possess it federally, you've got states that have basically legalized it. So there's a real issue there. I mean, the DEA still tries to use helicopter surveillance to take out people who are growing marijuana, take out the, the plants that are out there. Um, this is not an issue that's come up in the presidential race because it's not an issue. The federal government's not going to change its position on marijuana, even if the states do. And finally, I want to ask you why it's important for young people to get involved in the political process. Because it's going to be your world pretty soon. This is the thing, and, and, and I, I saw the, the number of young people that swar swarmed to, to uh, Bernie Sanders, and I, it was really nice to see young people that engaged. Because I think a lot of times, Young people feel like, and I know I felt this way when I was younger, that it didn't matter, what, your vote didn't matter, it didn't count, because they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And, and you know, when you're young, you have, you have your mind on other things. I, I was a young person once myself. But I think it's incredibly important to have young people being as engaged as possible. There's a little thing called critical thinking that I don't think 
we teach enough in this society. And I mean, when I was your age, I was on the school newspaper and I, and I was interested in politics, but not to the degree that I am now. The reason why, one of the reasons why I do what I do, and I focus mostly on local politics when I write, but one of the reasons why I still am involved in this battle is because of young people. I don't think it's ever been more important for political reporters to be good at what they do. Because I think that the next generation sees that and, and it provides some hope that maybe one day our leaders will start to listen to us. So I think it's incredibly important that young people get involved. I would like to see more young people take more stands. I think this is great what you guys are doing here. It's important. It's important that you involve yourself in the process now. Because this is going to be your world. And the more you know about what it means to elect somebody to be your leader, the more you know about the issues surrounding that debate, the better off you're going to be and the better off society will be long after Mr. Murphy and I have shuffled off this mortal coil. It's your world very, very soon. So you've got to learn as much about it as you can while you have time. Chris Collins, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, again, we are broadcasting live on Election Day at 5 p.m. We'll be bringing uh, exit poll information conducted by uh, the students at Frontier um, from the four towns. Uh, so please don't miss that. And, uh, yeah, have a good night.